want to encourage you to find the sermon notes inside your bulletin. And uh, you can take those out and use them as a guide as we look at this familiar passage of Scripture together today. Have you ever sent a formal announcement to family and friends? Uh, Maybe you were at the end of the last semester of your high school or college career and you were feeling pretty confident uh, that you were going to pass those finals and so you sent out a graduation announcement so that uh, family and friends would come and and celebrate that occasion with you. Uh, Or or many, uh, maybe ladies, Uh, your boyfriend uh, proposed. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the two of you uh, sent out wedding announcements to let family and friends know to save the date uh, so that they could be with you on the day that uh, you celebrated your wedding together. Or maybe you had uh, parents or grandparents who were celebrating their 25th or 50th wedding anniversary, and you sent out a wedding announcement to family and friends to let them know about this surprise gathering to honor them on such an occasion. Uh, Well, when our daughter, Sharia, uh, was born over 23 years ago now, uh, my wife Kathy and I decided that we wanted to do something a little different to announce her birth. And so we ordered these specially wrapped Hershey bars that were pink in color and contained the words, here she is, rather than Hershey's. And uh, the candy bar, just like the one on the screen behind me, uh, had Sherea's name on it and her date of birth positioned underneath. And it was a real hit with our our family and friends as we sent that out. Uh, But our announcement as clever and as uh, creative as it was, doesn't come close to matching the one that God the Father gave to reveal the arrival of His Son into our world. History's greatest birth announcement is recorded for us in Luke chapter 2. So I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles there with me this morning, uh, once again to Luke 2. And as you are well aware, uh, Luke 2 is the most familiar of all the Christmas stories in the Bible. It's the text that we read at our Christmas Eve candlelight service this past Friday night. And when preparing my message for this week, which I knew we were going to have a Christmas-themed service today, and I wanted to speak from this passage, but I I asked myself as I was working on the message, what could I possibly say about this text that people have not already heard before? So I was forced to look at this story again from a fresh perspective with new eyes, so to speak. And, And while much could be said about the birth of Jesus Christ from this passage. I want to focus our attention this morning on the announcement of Jesus' birth and its implications for our lives today. So let me uh, just mention a couple of details about this announcement. Uh, First of all, it was a spectacular announcement. Uh, Look at verses 9 and 10 again. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, that is, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. One minute, the shepherds are talking quietly among themselves under the blackness of the night sky, and the next moment, the Hillside is ablaze with light and the booming sound of an angel's voice. Now Luke doesn't tell us in this text who that angel was, but we have a good guess who it probably was. It was probably Gabriel. Gabriel was the angel that God used to announce to Mary that she was going to give birth to a son. And then it was Gabriel again who announced to Joseph that what was conceived within Mary was of the Holy Spirit, and that he should go ahead and marry her. So 
it's very likely that it's Gabriel again here that God is using to announce the birth of Christ to this group of shepherds. And notice again in verse 9 that it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. It was a bright light. And this light represented the radiance of the Lord's glory. It reminded me when I read that verse of um, a passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, where the Apostle Paul says, He, that is God, lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach Him. No human eye has ever seen Him, nor ever will. All honor and power to Him forever. Amen. The angel who had been in the presence of God in heaven now bears the same bright glory when visiting the shepherds on earth. And we see what the response of the shepherds was to this angel appearing to them. It says that the shepherds were terrified. Uh, literally, the text says they feared a great fear. And understandably so right? They had never experienced anything like this before, and they had no clue what was happening. And so a moment later, the sky was filled with a host of angels who declared the praises of God because of the announcement that they had just heard. Look at verses 13 and 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so if the glory of God reflected by the one angel blanketed the entire area, imagine with me if you can what the glory reflected by the multitude of angels must have looked like. Well, there's a second thing we need to know about this announcement. It was not only a spectacular announcement, it was also a private announcement. Look again at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. But when a person of significance is born, for example, let's say a king, it's normally the occasion for a public celebration. Yet the news of Jesus' birth was given to just a small group of shepherds who were watching their flocks in a field in the middle of the night. Surprisingly, just a few people heard this initial birth announcement. Chris Rice uh, recorded a, a popular Christmas song years ago entitled, Welcome to Our World. The song contains these lyrics. We've been waiting for you. Please make yourself at home. Speaking, of course, of the Christ child. But the reality is, other than the shepherds and Mary and Joseph, no one else was aware that Jesus was even born that night. So what is the good news? What is the content of this announcement, this birth announcement? Well, the main idea is this. The Messiah has come. Look at verse 11 with me. The angel said to the shepherds, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The word Messiah means the anointed one. And the Old Testament prophets had predicted the coming of the Messiah a man of God's own choosing who would provide salvation for Israel. And in Jesus' day, the Jews were highly anticipating the arrival of their Messiah, their warrior king, who would deliver Israel from the hands of the Romans. And the angel was announcing that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah and that their Messiah had finally come. Now, there's two truths uh, in this announcement pertaining to the Messiah that the angel communicates to the shepherd. These are also found in verse 11. The first truth is this, that the Messiah, or Jesus, is the Savior. The Savior. 
The word Savior speaks of one who rescues. But Jesus did not come to rescue Israel from the Romans. He came to rescue all of mankind from our sins. In fact, this is what the angel Gabriel said to Joseph when he appeared to him. This event is recorded in Matthew chapter 1. The angel said to Joseph, and she, Mary, will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And sin may be defined as the breaking of God's laws or commands. It's our sin that separates us from God. It's what brings us under God's judgment. Sin that is not atoned for will lead to an eternity in hell. But as Savior, Jesus invites all of us to trust in Him and Him alone for the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. The second truth that we learn about Jesus in this announcement is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Lord means master or the leader of one's life. When the Jews would read the Old Testament scriptures, whenever they would come across the name Yahweh, the divine name that God had given himself, when they would come across that in the Hebrew scriptures, they would not pronounce it because they believed it was too holy of a name to, either, to even utter with their lips. And so that when they would come across that name, Yahweh, in the scriptures, they would replace it with a different name, Adonai which is Hebrew for, for Lord. And then in Jesus' day, everybody spoke common Greek, and so the Old Testament was translated into the common Greek language, and the word that was used to replace uh, both Yahweh and Adonai was kurios, which again means Lord, and it would appear in all capital letters to make absolutely clear to the reader that the person in view here is Yahweh, the God of Israel. And therefore, by referring to Jesus as Lord, the angel was clearly identifying him as Yahweh, the God of Israel. And as Lord and God, Jesus has the right to tell us how we are to live our lives. And we are to be obedient to his commands. And Jesus beckons all of us to come and to follow him. Now, not all announcements require a response. When we sent out Sharia's birth announcements, we didn't expect anybody to respond to it other than to say, hey, that was cute, we like that, you know, congratulations. But many announcements do require a response, don't they? If you want to attend a wedding reception or a special birthday party, you often have to complete and return the RSVP card. And in a similar way, if you want to benefit from the good news of Jesus' birth announcement, it will require an appropriate response. And there are several appropriate responses to the good news that are mentioned in this passage. I just want to draw your attention to two of them this morning. The first appropriate response is this, investigate the evidence. Investigate the evidence. The angels expected the shepherds to investigate his claims. And that's why he mentioned the two signs in verse 12. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Uh, sign number one, the baby will be wrapped in strips of cloth. This was a common practice in the first century to wrap a, a newborn baby in strips of cloth to keep that baby warm and to also to create a womb effect, uh, a sense of security. And so this was no surprise to the shepherds that uh, the angel said, you'll find this baby wrapped in strips of cloth. But here was the second sign, uh, that he will be lying in a manger. And this is where the shepherds did a double take. Say what? <laughs> what, what, what? Say that again? 
this, the Messiah, the King, the one we've been waiting for, is, should be born in a palace. A manger is a feeding trough for animals that you would find in a stable. Why are we going to find our king there? So that did come as a huge surprise to them. Now, they had a choice to make, right? They could have said, that doesn't sound right to me. That doesn't sound believable. And so I'm not going to go and investigate the angel's claims. I'm just going to stay right here in the field. But that isn't how the shepherds responded, did they? They actually went to Bethlehem to confirm that what the angel had told them was true. We see that in verse 15. When the angels, not just the single angel, but the multitude of angels left them and they had gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. We even see an evidence of faith on their part before they get there, right? And yet they're willing to go and investigate the evidence. They took the initiative to go and investigate the angels' claims. Now, consider what they did in contrast to the chief priests and the uh, teachers of the law when the Magi appeared before King Herod and said, we've been following this star who's supposed to lead us to the newborn king of Israel. And where's he to be born? It's the stars led us this far. We don't know where to go from here. And Herod didn't know where the king of the Jews was to be born, where the Messiah was to be born. And so he calls together the chief priests and the teachers of the law and asks them. And they give him the right answer. Bethlehem. But none of them bothered to go to see if the Messiah had actually been born. They had the opportunity. They were, in a sense, given an announcement. And they ignored it. Not so the shepherds. And there's one thing, uh, a principle that I'd like to share with you uh, that relates to what the shepherds did. And the principle is this. Seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Look at verse 16. So they, the shepherds, hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, just, just as the angel had told them. When the shepherds saw the baby, Jesus, lying in the manger, they believed the Messiah has truly come. But you're sitting there thinking, Rex, uh, all right, good for them. None of us are eyewitnesses of the birth of Christ. So then how can we believe that these things are true? You just said seeing is believing. And I, my answer to you is this. Investigate the evidence, just like the shepherds did. Um, as you're thinking about that, I want to share with you briefly the, the testimony of a man by the name of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel. He's the author uh, of this classic Christian book called The Case for Christ. If you've never read it, I want to encourage you to get a copy of it. It's an excellent, excellent book. Lee Strobel is a former award-winning journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He used to be a self-proclaimed atheist. Uh, Strobel believed that Jesus was a historical figure, but he thought that Jesus was nothing more than this unusually kind and wise Jewish rabbi who lived in Palestine uh, during the beginning of the first century. But when his wife, Leslie, became a Christian, Strobel was so impressed with the fundamental changes that took place in her character and behavior that he decided to launch an all-out investigation into the facts surrounding the case for Christianity. Uh, Strobel read books, he interviewed experts, he asked questions, he analyzed history, explored archaeology, studied ancient literature, and picked the Bible apart verse by verse. And again, much of his journey is recorded in this book, The Case for Christ. And over time, the evidence began to point to the unthinkable for Strobel, that Jesus is 
who he actually claimed to be, who the Bible says he is, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And like Lee Strobel, we too need to be willing to investigate the good news to determine for ourselves whether or not it's true. And if it is true, then the appropriate response is to believe in Jesus as the only one who can rescue you from your sins. Appropriate response number two would be to share the good news. We know from verses 17 and 18 that the shepherds told others about what they had seen and heard. Follow along as I read those verses. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Uh, Everyone who heard what the shepherds shared were amazed. And it's peculiar that they would have done that. It was unique that they would have done that because most people living in Palestine at that time looked at shepherds as an unruly bunch and people that were not to be trusted, that they were untrustworthy. Maybe they saw the bright light in the sky and had no uh, explanation for it, uh, for this natural phenomena. And so they were willing to hear and receive what the shepherds had told them. We don't know, but they believed what they said and they rejoiced with them. And that gives us another principle that we can take with us today, and that is the good news is for everyone. It's for everyone. Why would God choose to make this announcement first to a group of lowly shepherds? Why not to the religious leaders? Why not to the uh, governing authorities? Why a group of shepherds? And I suggest the reason is because God wants to identify with the lowly, with those who are considered outcasts in society. As you look at the life of Jesus and his earthly ministry, these are the types of people that he often hung around with, that he spent time with. And that reminds us that Jesus came for all people, not just for those who think that they have their act together. As a matter of fact, we know from the gospel accounts that most people who thought that they had their act together either were opposed to Jesus' ministry or just ignored him altogether. But we again are reminded of the words of the angel to the shepherds in verse 10, I bring you good news that will bring joy to all the people, to all people. And again, for the shepherds, that would have been a shock to them to hear the angel say this because they, yes, they were awaiting the arrival of the Messiah, but they believed and they were taught by the religious leaders that that the Messiah was coming only to save the Jews. So why would this be good news to all people? Again, we're reminded of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Why the Jew first? Well, the Jews are God's covenant people in terms of a nation. They're the only nation that has ever existed that God called out from among the nations to be his own special people. And so he established a covenant relationship with Israel, and he entrusted his word to them. So the good news is for the Jews first, but also the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Everybody who's not a Jew. (laughs) So Jews and Gentiles, that's everyone. The good news is for everyone. And and I want to suggest that many Christians struggle with sharing the good news with others. Um, they, They lack the confidence to do that. Maybe they lack the courage to do that. They just think it, it it's I know it's something that God wants me to do. I just don't think that I can do it. But I want to tell you that sharing the good news with others is really quite simple. It really is. It involves three things. Number one, it it just means 
telling somebody else about what your life was like apart from Christ, before you knew Christ as your Savior. Second, and it, it, it involves discussing the events that led you to Christ, how, how you heard the gospel message and how you responded to it and what led you to actually put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And third, it then you share with the person about how your life has changed as a result of, of coming to know Jesus as your Savior. I want to suggest that really sharing your testimony in that way is really one of the most effective ways of sharing the good news. Why? Because it's your story, and nobody can argue with your story. It happened to you, and it's important to you. You don't have to fumble over words when you're just telling somebody your story. It's just, it comes from a heart that desires and, and puts forth the effort to tell other people about how God has transformed your life and given you life, your life, meaning and purpose and hope and joy and, and uh, confidence. Because, and you want to share that with others because you know that God is able to do the same thing for them too. What was the end result for the shepherds after having this encounter with the angel and hearing the birth announcement and investigating the angel's claims and, and going to see the baby Jesus for themselves? The end result for them was unspeakable joy. We know from verse 20 that the shepherds returned to their flocks glorifying and praising God. Let me read verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Again, the words of the angel, I will bring good news that will bring great joy. J.C. Ryle has said, the journey that is begun in faith will generally end in praise. That's exactly what happened with the shepherds. After receiving the announcement from the angel, they investigated his claims. They went to Bethlehem. They found the baby Jesus lying in a manger, wrapped in strips of cloth, just as they had been told. And then they went out and told others everything that they had seen and heard before returning to their flocks praising God all along the way their hearts were filled with unspeakable joy and my question for you this morning is this does knowing that the savior has come bring you unspeakable joy and let me suggest a couple things. Number one, it won't if you don't think that you need a rescuer. In May of 2013, three women uh, named Amanda Berry, uh, Georgina De Jesus, De Jesus, and Michelle Knight were freed from 10 years of captivity in a residential house in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, the reason that they were able to get out is because their captor, a man by the name of Ariel Castro, had left the house for uh, a short period of time thinking that they were bound, and one got free and couldn't get out of the house because the doors were locked from the outside, but she started screaming and a neighbor heard her and helped her get out. And so when uh, the, um, she told the neighbor that I'm not the only one that was in that house. There are two other young women who are there as well. And that's when the police came and, uh, and, and rescued these other two women as well. And I just want you to think with me for a moment. What if the police had, had uh, arrived at the house and were getting ready to pry open the doors of that house to free those women, to rescue them, and either Georgina or Michelle said, no, 
don't need to do that. We're okay. We don't need to be rescued. It's unthinkable, (laughs) right, that any of these women in that situation would have responded that way. As a matter of fact, this was in a bad part of, of Cleveland, and what made national news, not only the fact that these young women had been captive for 10 years and then released, but the neighbor was an African-American man. And they have video of these white women embracing him and thanking him for going out of his way to make sure that they could get free. But they would never have turned away somebody that was seeking to rescue them from their dire circumstance. And yet, the reality is that today, many people think that they're okay and they don't need to be rescued. And so they're not filled with joy and knowing that a rescuer has come. The truth is, all of us need to be rescued from our sins. And in His grace and in His mercy, God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be that rescuer. And if we will confess our sins to God and to turn from them and turn to Him and ask Jesus to be our rescuer, our sins will be forgiven. And then we just need to choose to follow Him the rest of our days. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you today to make today the day that you ask Jesus to be your rescuer. And Jesus gives us this promise in John 5, 24, that if we do that, if we believe in the one that God has sent, basically he's saying, if you believe in me, then you have crossed over today from death into life. That can be your story, the story that you can begin to share with others, the story of how Jesus rescued you. One other thing I want to say, and this one's more directed towards those who have asked Jesus to be their rescuer. Does knowing that the Savior has come stir up unspeakable joy within you? And I want to suggest it won't if you continue to focus on the temporary rather than the eternal. You may be sitting there today and say, yes, Rex, I know that Jesus has saved me from my sins, but I lack joy because I'm in poor health or I don't have enough money to pay my bills or my relationship with my spouse or my kids is not what I want it to be or I have never realized my dreams. But I want to tell you this morning, friend, brother and sister in Christ, That if Jesus is your Savior, the following is true of you. You are a child of God. You are part of the family of God. God is making you more and more like Jesus every day of your life. And there will be a day that you will live with God and with his children forever. Forever. These are the blessings that are available to you who have put your faith in Christ as your rescuer. And these are the things that truly matter. If you focus on the spiritual blessings that you have for all eternity, rather than the temporary blessings of this world, then you will be filled with unspeakable joy that no one can ever take from you. All of these spiritual blessings and so many more are available to you who are in Christ because of the great news of, or the good news of great joy that the angel announced to the shepherds over 2,000 years ago. Again, these words, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Jesus, the Rescuer, has come. Now that really is good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, not just this morning, but uh, really this weekend to have a a time of concentrated focus on the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we thank you 
for uh, supernaturally announcing this birth uh, the way that you did to the shepherds and, um, and for the re their response that is recorded for us in the scriptures that we may learn from them in terms of their response. And just as they investigated the evidence to see if the claims of the angel were true, I want to pray for everyone here today who would not yet consider themselves to be a follower of Jesus Christ because they're not convinced yet that the case for Christianity is a valid one. But I pray, Lord, that they would not let those questions keep them from investigating the truth. And maybe a book like The Case for Christ would be a great place to start. Um, to give them the opportunity to think through uh, the case for Christianity, the claims of Christ, and why he came into this world. I pray that your spirit would be at work in their hearts to convince them that these things are true. And I also pray for those who are here today who are believers in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would fill our hearts with an unspeakable joy as we choose to focus on the things that are eternal rather than the things that are just temporary. Because when we focus on the things that are temporary, we can focus on that which we don't have rather than what we do have and what we've been promised. And so, Lord, I am convinced that as we keep our focus on Christ and who he is and what he has come to do for us that, and, and the promises that are in store for us, that we can live with this unspeakable joy every single day of our lives. And nobody can take it from us. It's a joy that comes from you. So would you fill our hearts with your joy this day? I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand together and sing.